Hello and welcome to the Climbing Daily Friday Gear Show. Now here at the Epic TV office, we're lucky enough to get sent a bunch of gear that we can test and use. And some of it goes into my climbing arsenal, so I get to use it more extensively over a longer period of time. So today I'm going to do a long term test review of three products. Now I've been using these consistently over the last year and beyond, and I've got some opinions on them. So we've got a rope, a harness and a bouldering pad. So something for everyone. We're going to start off with the bouldering pad, and this is the Snap Stamina Pad. Now, I'd say this is a mid-range pad, both in terms of size and price. It costs €189 Euros on the Epic TV shop, which is kind of in the middle between super expensive and very, very cheap. Now, the size of this for me is kind of perfect for a one do it all pad. So whenever I'm going on a trip, let's say Font or Magic Wood or anywhere bouldering, really, this would be the main one that I take. If I need a second pad, I tend to sort of complement it with something like the Camp Domino, the mini one, the mini Domino, uh, just because this is a nice medium size and sometimes you want a smaller one just to fill in those little holes. I love the styling of the snap pads. There's something about that two-tone color and the slightly matte look of the color itself that I personally think is really classy and it's nice and durable. And talking about durability, the outside is absolutely bomber. It's made with polyester TPU stuff and it's 100% recycled. So if you're an eco warrior or you just care about the environment, this is a good pad to go for. In my opinion, pads should take some abuse. They need to be chucked in a car, scraped on rocks, thrown down hills, and if they kind of fall apart, then, I mean, it's just failed as a pad. This one, I've put some serious abuse into it, and so far, it's stood up absolutely perfectly. Now, let's talk about padding. To start with, there's 15 millimeters of EVA foam. Now, that is a harder foam layer that absorbs the initial impact. Underneath that, there's 10 centimeters, not millimeters, centimeters this time, of polyurethane foam, which absorbs the impact. Now, pad impact-wise, I can't fault this thing. I've taken some big falls on it, and it feels nice and cushioned. It's almost similar to one of those snap air pads that has a sort of built-in air pad system within it, but this is foam, and it feels great for me. No issues in terms of that. Let's talk about the fastening system. It closes using this Velcro tabs. Now, I've had a few different opinions come at me on this pad. I've got a mate of mine who absolutely hates it, just finds it sort of fiddly the way you have to feed it through, prefers one of those hook metal systems. Personally, I haven't found a problem with it, to be honest. I think it's quick, it's easy. The Velcro is very, very sticky, and you can shove loads of things in this pad without that Velcro coming undone. So for me, it does its job pretty damn well. So let's talk about how this pad folds. Now, generally, pads fall into two folding categories. There's a style that folds with a little fold, <laughs> literally in it, so a line, a crease going down the middle of it. And that's often supported underneath, so when you land on that fold, it doesn't just collapse down. Or you get a taco style, which is what the Snap Stamina does. And that folds into a single piece of foam. Now, I kind of like that because when you're climbing up a rock, you look down, it's just one flat surface. You know, there's no little dodgy bits to land on. However, it does have its disadvantages. The main one being that when you fold it out initially, it can take a while to settle down. It sort of comes into a little curve shape. Now that's in no way a problem if you're working a project, but it is a little bit irritating if you're moving between boulders. So let's say that you're doing a font circuit, you're quickly smashing out a route, moving to the next one, folding it up between times. It will just take a few moments to settle down. You have to sort of stand on it, bash it down. Not a big problem, just, a consideration. The other issue with a taco style fold is it's harder to, um, to protect rocks. So you know when you've got like a sticky bit of rock and you have one with a fold, you can put it over the top and then down the edge. With a taco style, that doesn't work as well. So if that is a consideration, then this might not be for you. But personally, I actually really like that taco fold. I think it works well. 
Now there's a few classy features on this pad which I really like, and the first being this little secret pocket on the front of it. Now you can't see it, it blends in, but inside of here, usually there's a little tiny carpet thing that you can use to clean your feet or brush it off and it's it's been lost currently but i'm sure we've got some b-roll going on while i'm talking uh it's brilliant because let's say you're in font we all know that sandstone is a delicate rock and around font there's lots of sand and if you have that on your feet you just ruin the rock pop out this little mat thing pop it on the ground clean your feet off or use it as a stepping stone to get to the boulder is brilliant because loads of people carry around an extra pad or literally a piece of carpet or matting to do the same thing this is built into the pad and i love that as a little feature now the strap system is worth talking about because Honestly, I don't think many pads get this right. And although this is interesting, I don't think it's 100% on this either. Now, the thinking behind this is that the carrying system is on the top of the mat. So this is the side that you would land on. The reason for this is if you put it on the underside, so you flip the whole thing around, the underside gets very muddy. So if you then put on a strap when you're leaving the bouldering area or between boulders, you get covered in mud and it's a bit gross. The problem being with the strap on the landing side is it can get in the way. You don't want to be falling and getting your feet sort of tangled up in all this mess. Now, the way, the reason to get through that is it's just Velcroed on, easy to take off, so you can tuck it underneath the pad. But once you've tucked it underneath the pad, it's then going to get muddy, which is the initial problem anyway. So, Snapper put in this little pocket thing. Uh, where is it? Yeah, little pocket thing on this side of the pad. So all you do is unattach it from one side and tuck it into that pocket to get it out of the way. It's a really good idea. It is a bit faffy to do. You have to sort of fiddle around with this, undo it, and then do it back up again, tuck it in. It's not ideal, but I like the fact they've thought about it. What I tend to do is just shove it underneath and get muddy shoulders anyway, but maybe I'm just lazy. The snap pad weighs 6.3 kilograms and it does feel quite hefty when you're carrying it around. Now, personally, I think that's a reasonable sacrifice to make for the amount of padding in this thing. I prefer to have a little bit of a heavier back and save my legs from breaking but that's me again. And if you're using it for long hikings, let's say you're somewhere in America and you've got to walk an hour to the boulder, you might want to go for something a bit lighter, but it's not really something that I have a problem with. Now we have a lot of pads here at the Epic TV shop, and this is the one that we always grab for shoots or climbing or whenever we need a bouldering pad. And I think that speaks volumes. Snap Stamina Pad, I've used you for a couple of years and I absolutely love you. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's move on to the Tendon Master 9.2 millimeter rope. Now I've discussed this before, but personally, I think buying a rope is one of the least exciting things you can do. I just want my rope to work really well for a long period of time and not get damaged. And this tendon rope has ticked every one of those boxes. I've been a big tendon fan for a while. I've used their half ropes, but this was their first, the first single rope that I used from tendon. I think it's pretty reasonably priced. It's 149 euros on the Epic TV shop for the 60 meter version. And that's great considering the amount of features that this rope has. We also sell it at 60, 70 and 80 meters with a slight price increase because of the extra length of the rope. Now this is 9.2 millimeters thick and I think that's a real sweet spot for climbing ropes. It's thin enough to still be lightweight. So if you're working right at your limit or you're red pointing something, it doesn't feel clunky or heavy or hard to handle, but it's not too thick. I think when you start getting up to like 9.9 .9 or 10 millimeter ropes, sure, it's got the durability, but it just feels clunky and horrible and heavy and 9.2 is good for me. Also, those really thin ropes when you start to get into the eights for a single rope slightly freak me out, but that could just be me. It's got Tendon's complete shield built into the rope. Now, Tendon use nanotechnology to coat tiny particles of Teflon to the sheath and the core, and that makes it virtually impregnable for rain or dust or anything that might get into your rope and rot it and damage it. And I have got this thing wet. It's been rained on, it's been on a soggy beach. It hasn't exactly been treated that well, apologies, Tendon. But there's no noticeable damage on it at all, and I I have really been using this almost every single weekend. Sometimes I find that a rope that hasn't got as good a treatment sort of develops 
a slightly rotten smelling smell to it. It smells damp and it feels a bit spongy, I suppose. I've never noticed that with this rope itself. Now, if the most important thing with the rope is to catch you when you fall, the second most important thing is how it feels and handles, both when you're belaying and when you're climbing. And the tendon is very impressive for that. There's an SBS simple braid system, which reads individual strands into the sheath. And that, according to tendons engineers, is why it handles so brilliantly. And it still does. That's what's bonkers about this. It's like, I've been using this for about two years and you can see it's soft and supple, it moves, it feels great in your hand. And it doesn't do that thing that I've encountered with other ropes where the rope becomes stiff, unmovable, horrible to clip, and most importantly, horrible in a gree-gree. This thing just floats through a gree-gree. Look, this is my workhorse rope. It's a fantastic rope. It's a fantastic price. There's nothing really else to say about it. I would buy it again when I eventually break it. And I've said really. And finally, in our long-term test, let's talk about the BL Ghost Harness. Now, I know I've been chatting about this a lot. It constantly comes up as one of my favorite bit of kit. But the reason I wanna talk about it again is two reasons. First of all, it's almost been exactly to a day, a year since I first put it on. And secondly, I've been abusing this thing. Because honestly, it's meant to be a fast and light harness. So think red points on your projects or think alpine climbing. However, me being me, I lost my main harness, which was a black diamond momentum, I think. And because I lost my main harness, I've had to use this thing for literally everything. And although it's not designed for literally everything, it means that I've managed to put it through the test thoroughly. It's very lightweight, 249 grams, I think, for the medium version, which is super light and it's super packable. And that's my favorite thing about it. When you fold it up, it has a very, very, very low profile. And I always used to think that fast and light harnesses were a bit of a gimmick. However, having used it, the pack size does make a difference, especially if you're packing for Alpine missions. The other day, it went up, went up to the Grand Jurassic. This just fitted into my bag so small, I barely noticed it. And the lightweight feel does feel good when you're sport climbing at your limit. With other harnesses, there's just a bit more padding, a bit more clunk, whereas the Ghost just feels, as the name suggests, like a ghost hardly there. Now, as I said, this is meant to be that sport climbing fast and light, but I've been using it for trad, uh, big routes, multi-pitches, skiing, just pretty much everything I can throw at it. There are some disadvantages for that. Uh, the gear loops, they're okay. The front one is nice and big and plastic and solid. That works well. The back one is deliberately designed to be floppy and minimal. It works if you're racking quick draws on the front. It doesn't work so well if you've got a big old trad rack on, but I kind of knew that it's not what it's designed for, but if you're trying to buy just one harness that does it all, that might be a problem for you. I thought that the lack of adjustment on the leg loops would be a problem. And that's because I want to use this for ski touring or alpine climbing. And it's sometimes useful to have that adjustability so you can totally take it off and then put it back on and not snag it on your crampons or ski boots. However, I haven't had a problem with it. I fitted this over ski trousers, it fits nicely, and there's enough stretch in the whole thing with this little bit of elasticated material here that means it can slide on very, very nicely. Now, sizing wise, I do find this a little bit strange. This is the medium, and I'm literally right at the limit of how much I can adjust it. I have to adjust it all the way to the very, very edge. Now, you might think, well, Matt, just get a small then if you need to adjust it that much. However, the small means the leg loops become too tight for me. So I had to go for the medium so the leg loops would fit and it wouldn't look all weird on me. It's right at the limit for me personally. Uh, and I think if you have a little bit of a bigger waist, it's not gonna be a problem. It might be worth trying it on before you buy though, just if that's gonna be a problem. We need to talk about wear and tear because on this belay loop, you can see the material has started to fray away a little bit. Now this is nothing structural, it's just where the, uh, the knitting kind of comes together and you could very easily cut it off and there's nothing structural that will be a problem with that. But it is a little bit disappointing. I've used it for a year, as I said, I've used it a lot for a year, but that kind of wear and tear, especially on the belay loop or down where your belay loop is, isn't really what you want to see. Not a structural issue, but something to consider for this long-term style. 
The other thing, and this is gonna sound weird, <laughs> is it tangles up a lot. And that's to do with the fact that you've got this tiny bit of uh, almost string elasticity uh, attaching the leg loops to the harness because of this Dyneema system that kind of, kind of twist up. It's not a problem, but it is a problem if you've shoved it in a bag or you've been traveling and you do one of those alpine starts at 2 a.m. It's dark, you're in a hut, you're in a bad mood, you haven't had a coffee and you're trying to work out how on earth this all twists together. Uh, not a problem, just a slight irritation. The final thing is the comfort of this harness. It's not designed for hanging around in a big wall for a long time, but I've been using this, because I lost my old one, for weighted fingerboards. So I've been strapping up to about 45 kilograms of weight onto this and then hanging off something and it actually feels great. I thought it would slice in, hurt me, cut me, just feel disgusting, but actually it's quite supportive. So I could hang around in this for quite a long period of time. If you're filming, for example, or if you're just be laying on a vertical wall and you're there for a couple of hours, yes, it's not gonna be as comfortable. It's not designed for that. But for kind of quick hits, it does a pretty good job. But one of the best things about the Ghost Harness is the price of the thing. For something this light, it's only 72 euros on the Epic TV shop. Now compare that to, well, in my opinion, its rival, the Petzl Sitter, which is about 139 euros on the Epic TV shop, and you can see the value of this product. I haven't noticed any real quality difference apart from that fraying on this harness, and I personally would definitely buy it again. So there you go, three very different things that I've been using for a long time now that I would recommend to you. But do let me know what you think. Have you used these products? Do you agree with my opinion or are there things that I haven't noticed or haven't come across? Do comment below and let me know. All of this stuff is linked down below in the copy if you wanna pick it up from the Epic TV shop. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.